Hello, welcome, or welcome back. I'm Ari, and today we are going to go over my 1950s wrap-up. Now, the 1950s are supposed to be like the perfect decade where people still got married and stayed married and the man worked and the wife was a stay-at-home mom and everybody had 2.5 kids and then shit went downhill from that. Um, obviously that is not true in, in any even vague sort of sense. It, it, it didn't happen. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there was the nuclear family was popular, but nothing was perfect. And honestly, the books that I read this month were all so depressing that I have no idea how anybody thinks the 1950s was this like miraculously amazing era. So <laughs> yeah, there's that. Starting out with 1951, I read The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. This book was kind of set up for me not to like it. It's written as a stream of consciousness story where a young teenage boy is just kind of going through like a couple of days of his life. There's no like set up big plot, it's just like, hey, this happened for a couple of days and I'm gonna tell you the story of it. It has a lot of talking, well anyway, well blah blah blah, go off on another tangent, well anyway back to the point that I was trying to make and that really annoys me in writing and that's just a personal thing. I know a lot of people don't bother it but it, it really bothers me um, and this entire book is this. It is two days in the life of a teenage boy and he is struggling with depression and the thing that I'm getting out of this book is what level of depression or anxiety excuses bad behavior because the young man Holden in this book is an awful shitty person. He treats women and just other people in general like absolute garbage, but he is suffering from a very severe depression from the death of his brother. And it's does that depression excuse his behavior towards other people uh, through his lashing out through the grief process or does nothing excuse this behavior? Um, and keep in mind this took place in the 1950s, like going to see a psychiatrist is not a solution at the time. So it's a very interesting story of you're struggling to feel sympathy for the character because he lost his brother, but you also like have no sympathy for him because he's a complete and total jerk. But three stars, like I said, I hate the stream of consciousness writing, so this was never really meant for me to begin with. 1952, I read Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. This is a children's book. It's really, really straightforward. A young girl named Fern, basically, she lives on a farm. They're, they've, they're, her father has, well, she lives on a farm and a bunch of pigs are born. And there's a one little runt pig who her father's going to go kill and she insists on saving it. Um, she saves it, she hand feeds it with a bottle and it survives even though it wasn't expected to. And then um, she has to give it to her uncle after a few months and the pig can live on its own just fine. And then her uncle is going to raise it and then kill it for Christmas dinner. But Wilbur, who's the pig, finds out that he's going to be Christmas dinner and he doesn't want to die. And so his only friend, who is a spider named Charlotte, starts writing things in her web to save Wilbur's life. And it's one of those things like the animals talk, blah blah blah, all fine. Um, it's one of those things though where <laughs> adults are really portrayed as like incredibly stupid because the writing in the spider web is somehow attributed to the pig and not an intelligent spider. Um, you do learn a lot about spiders 
which is kind of cool because most kids just are afraid and hate spiders so having like a kind friendly spider is a very cool thing to have in a children's book and that's that's basically the whole story it's fine it's a children's book obviously not my thing because I am not a child I still think it's fine to allow your children to read it a lot of these classic children's books are a big hell no for letting your children read it in modern times but this one perfectly fine uh three stars again for 1953 i read fahrenheit 451 and this <laughs> i knew kind of what it's about but the ending of this just took this like twist that i was not expecting and i'm not going to tell you what it is i'm just going to tell you that i don't know what the f happened it came out of literally nowhere and kind of increased my dislike for this book there it's a post-apocalyptic well no um this is a dystopia novel very similar vein to 1984 where everybody is supposed to be treated equally and society is controlled through ignorance and violence and the main character montag is a firefighter but firefighters in this universe start fires they burn books instead of putting out fires so the entire point of this is to keep humanity ignorant by not allowing them to read literature and he goes through an existential crisis about burning books he wants to read the books instead of burn them and shit goes downhill and there's a huge twist at the end that like I said doesn't make any sense at all in the context of the story and I was just kind of like the fuck just happened <laughs> why Fahrenheit 451 also got three stars next up for 1954 was Lord of the Flies we're keeping on brand with the depressing books here this is by Will William Golding and it is about a group of young boys from like 6 to I want to say like 15 get or going somewhere on an airplane and the airplane crashes on a deserted island and they like only the children survive the pilot is the only adult as far as we can tell on the airplane and the pilot is dead on impact and the boys kind of live on this island and one a couple of them want to be responsible and then so they set up a bonfire that's supposed to be burning at all times so it can be seen and then they can be rescued but then other boys just want to like have fun and goof off and hunt so their big thing is like hunting pigs with like sticks like uh like savages um is how they do it and then it's kind of like a this thing between keeping the fire burning but wanting to just have fun and not being responsible and it goes back and forth and then it gets like darker and darker um with like different deaths and how some of these children are reacting to the authority of other children um instead of talking it through becoming violent and angry and I expected a whole lot of things going into this because I really do like dark books like this but I should have known better because this is a middle grade book this is made for children so obviously it's going to have like a happy ending uh, and I just for some reason thought that this was going to continue to be dark and it while it was dark at times it wasn't nearly as dark as what I prefer personally prefer in my writing so I gave it three stars again Next up for 1955, I read Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov, and I don't know what the F I expected going into this book, but this was just straight up as creepy as I expected it to be. Like, 
why I thought a book about a man who has a sexual obsession with a 12 year old girl was going to turn out okay in the end. Uh, no. <laughs> no, this was so fucked up. I was just disgusted. I couldn't read it straight through because I was just so uncomfortable. Novikov does an amazing job of writing a or from a like pedophile's perspective and I think that's why this is a classic because he obviously was not a pedophile but he was somehow able to get into this perspective of the abnormal um, like obviously a pedophile is very low on the chain of acceptable humanity um, and shouldn't exist as people like ship them to an island, light the island on fire, pedophiles are fucking creepy and need to go. But the fact that he can make this from the perspective of a pedophile and kind of give the reader like justifications. And I mean, obviously anybody could tell the, just the justifications are disgusting and creepy, but it's it's a very it's very very well written is kind of what I'm getting at here. Um, there are a lot of like trigger warnings for this. This 12 year old girl is constantly every single night sexually assaulted by a man in his 30s for over two years. Like there is nothing redeeming about this book as far as content. So I personally would say do not read this. Like I could have happily gone the rest of my life without ever reading this and I'm never going to view the term like Lolita as far as like clothing styles as an innocent thing ever again and it kind of disgust me in like every single form possible now but it is really well written so it gets a two star instead of a one star just because of the beauty of the writing even if the content of it was one of the most offensively disgusting things I've ever read. Next up being not at all happier than anything else I've read this decade for 1956. I read Night by Eli Weisel. <laughs> um, I went into this book blind as a prompt for Make Your Myth Taker readathon and did not realize this is a non-fiction account of the Holocaust, <laughs> which is a very hard thing to just randomly pick up and start reading not knowing what you're getting into. So I've decided I don't like the go into a book blind prompt anymore. <laughs> um, no, uh, that was that was a very, very unhappy first day of the month. This is very straightforward. It's not overly emotional or underly emotional. He is just day by day going like, this is what happened to me. Uh, it's not really day by day, it goes kind of like, obviously there's skips in time where it's like, it started like this, um, we weren't afraid, we thought we were going to be protected, our neighbors were going to be protect us, and then it got worse for us, and we went to the ghettos, and then it got worse for us, and they loaded us on a train, and then it got worse for us, and we arrived at Auschwitz, and then it kind of went through there and then you even have times where he has like hindsight that he puts in where it's like I was afraid to die and I chose to do this in hindsight I made it worse for myself or I made it better for myself and it's just one of those things where it was really really hard to read but is a really powerful story so if you liked the diary of Anne Frank and you thought that was a powerful story, this one actually goes into the concentration camps instead of just what's happening before going to the concentration camps. I did rate Night four stars. It's hard to rate it five stars because it was just... I, I don't rate nonfiction five stars because it's not enjoyable. 
Like, this really happened to a person, so I can't say I got any enjoyment out of reading it, but it was a powerful message. 1957, I read Dr. Zhivago by Boris Pasternak. This one, it's like a historical fiction that follows a group of intertwined people in their daily lives through the Russian Revolution and the formation of the Soviet Union. And some of the people are like wealthy uh, as children, and then some of them are poor as children, but they kind of all end up being poor at the end. And it kind of goes through like how their lives like will meet at points and then go apart and then meet and then go apart and it's depressing i mean it covers the russian revolution it reads a lot like the grapes of wrath where it's these people are driven to poverty through no real fault of their own. The major problem I had with this book is every single character has like at least four names and they're just like randomly interchanged all the time and it makes it really really confusing. I actually have the book I read it as a physical copy, it's just not very pretty to hold up. But I will give you an example of the names and why this is so, so confusing. So the titular character, Dr. Zhivago, his name is Yuri Andreevich Zhivago. Full name. As a child, he is called Yura. Just Yura, Y-U-R-A. Um, his mistress calls him uh, Yurochka. Sometimes he is called Yuri, sometimes he is called Yuri Andreevich, and then sometimes he's called Zhivago, or Dr. Zhivago. So that's at least five names, four of them, which are like very distinct, like Yura, Yurochka, Yuri, Dr. Zhivago, Yuri Andreevich. Like that that's a lot of like way different names. And the fact that like in the middle of a sentence it'll start using a different one of the names and there's no rhyme or reason and the fact that they do this with every single character. There's even one character in the book who just takes on a completely new name in the middle of the book as like a secret identity and then people start referring him to that name and you're like wait, I, how, how is he connected to this previous character? And it, it's just, it's confusing. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, it's very, very confusing. Overall, it was boring, honestly. If I'm gonna be honest, I don't, it's not my type. It reads like a contemporary, not my type of novel. It was a three star because it wasn't like bad by any means, but I was bored. 1958, I read Breakfast at Tiffany's by Truman Capote. Capote? Probably said that wrong. Anyway, this is not like the movie. Actually, no. It is like the movie, but it's not like the movie. So the plot line of Breakfast with Tiffany's is almost exactly the same plot line as the movie. Breakfast with Tiffany's. The huge distinction is in the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's, Paul and Holly fall in love. There is a relationship there. In the book, there is absolutely no love relationship or even any like real crushing um, between Paul and Holly in the book, and it completely changes both of their characters and how they interact with each other and it's a lot darker in the book than it is in the movie and it's a lot unhappier. Holly is by far a worse, worse person in the book just because there's no 
romance situation. But as, other than that, like the story's almost exactly the same. So it's really weird how just adding that romance aspect completely changes the entire tone of the story. Um, there is a lot, a lot of racial slurs in here. Um, if you remember the movie, there is the Mickey Rooney situation where uh, Mickey Rooney is playing a Japanese man and that's just trashy. It's worse in the book. Um, there's also sexism. There's like a lot of gay slurs where Holly likes to talk about people being dykes all the time and that's inappropriate and not okay. Um, and then obviously racism against African Americans is very predominant in this as well. Um, I gave this a two star. I mostly the racism and sexism was just not okay with me even if it is dated. Like a lot of these other stories are published within the same decade and there's not like predominant racism throughout like there is in this one. So just because this is an old book, I don't excuse the racism of it. I didn't like it. And then I think not having that love story like just really changed the plot where both Paul and Holly are horrible, horrible characters, especially Holly. Holly has got to be one of the worst, worst characters. I've ever read. She is a nightmare human. 1959, I read The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. This one was very interesting. Still dark, still depressing. Like I said, we have no happy books this this month. Um, the main character, like the narrator of the story, is a very unreliable narrator and it makes the story so much more interesting with her being an unreliable narrator. Her reactions to the scene and what's going on around her are so different than what a like normal human would react in that situation that it just sets up the eerie atmosphere of the novel and then makes it horrific and creepy and gives you anxiety because you're like why is she behaving like this like this is not a rational way to behave in this situation and Shirley Jackson just did an amazing job with that. Was I scared? No. It, it's not really scary, it's just it ups your anxiety levels quite a bit. I gave this three stars. And then finally, we're still not getting happy here. There's there's nothing happy about the 1950s. I read To Kill a Mar Mockingbird, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. And this is about, it's from the perspective of a young girl. Her name is Scout and her father is a lawyer who was assigned to defend a black man who was falsely accused of rape. And it was so blatantly a false accusation, but racism is also so blatant at the time that he's going to get, like, he's going to go to jail for it anyway. Like, there's no question. And then the town's mad at Scout's father for even agreeing to defend, or even for trying to defend the this black man. This is a book where the racism makes sense. The book is about racism. And it's a really, really good look for children into racism. It's not like as an adult a lot of this was like overbearing um it was believable but it's it's something that is like clearly taught in public schools and i feel like as an adult going into racism needs to be deeper than this so saying oh yeah that people were racist back in the 1950s we already knew that we're not racist now it's like no this racism still exists, it's just not as like open and blatant as it was at the time. 
we're still dealing with a situation, the exact same situation in modern times, it's just people aren't vocal about this level of racism, they internalize it and then instead of, like it's easier to spot racism in this book because people are shouting about it and calling him names and saying horrible stuff, but this kind of racism still exists, it's just not as vocalized. And that's what we need to take away from reading something like that in modern times. The main purpose of this book is the fact that Scout's father Atticus is a very good man and he goes, like, he lives his life trying to teach his children lessons about being good people without making demands of them or telling them that they are wrong or insulting other people in his lessons of goodness. Do I recommend this? Yes. Do I understand why this is taught in schools all the time? Yes. Did I love it? No, not really. That That's a easy three stars again. And that's everything. That's all I have for the 1950s and let me know what you think about any of these books if you've read them in the description below if you have a different opinion than i do and i will catch you next time with another video